Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Bacon Bears and I have a podcast called That's My Opinion where we talk about things and I give you my opinion. Today is the last and third installment in the face-to-face -face docuseries with Scott Peterson that aired on Peacock. I give you all of my opinions on this. That's all they are, opinions. This one's called Investigations, Appeals, and Lingering Questions which I have so many. With that being said, we're gonna get started. But if you like what you see here today, don't forget to subscribe and share this with the world so we can achieve world domination because that's really the ultimate goal, isn't it? So they open up this episode with a quote that is most murder cases are circumstantial and you rarely get a smoking gun. I cannot talk, you rarely get a smoking gun. And the episode really starts off with arguing both sides, how Scott can be guilty and how he could be maybe not proven innocent, but there is a reasonable doubt. And it's not just about one piece of circumstantial evidence. It's about all of the things being put together like a puzzle. However, there was no cause of death that has been determined. There was no crime scene. There was no evidence that Scott had committed a crime, especially a violent crime against his wife. There's no murder weapon. There's no blood. So if you truly are in the headspace of a juror, which way are you leaning? And after 40 hours of deliberation, you have to assume that 12 people did not see eye to eye. Somebody had to be convinced. I want you to leave a comment now on what you think and then leave a comment at the very end of this episode about what you think and let me know if your mind has changed. Also, after we've explained this, let me know if your mind has changed. Did you think he was guilty and now you don't? or vice versa. The jurors that were being interviewed had said that with the information, now this is this is a key point, with the information that they were given inside of the courtroom, they came up ultimately with the only decision that they could make. Another says there was absolutely no alternate theory, which is important. That's when they start to introduce the burglary and perhaps if the burglary was allowed into evidence into this case, then maybe they would have had an alternative theory. Everyone is still investigating and asking questions. And Scott says it's going to be a fight for them to accept the truth. December 13th, 2004, the jury sentences Scott Peterson to death. And again, Scott shows no emotion. Scott says that in the courtroom, he was indignant because he was so angry with the media. And I quote, I didn't want to, you know, see them break me. And that moment when he's talking about that just screams pride. Your life is in the balance. You've lost your wife. You've lost your son. You've lost your girlfriend in Amber Fry. You've lost your entire in-law family, you're gonna lose your freedom, and you're worried about how the media sees you again. Because this is not the first time that he's brought this up about how he's not going to give the media anything. And this would have been a great time for the interviewer or the investigative journalist or the documentarian to say, why were you more concerned with about how the media perceived you than anything else? Why is that first and foremost on your brain. You are so concerned with them not seeing you have a natural human reaction. You've lost everything for you to break down and cry and you're about to lose your life for what you claim you didn't do. It's it's a very bizarre, and I understand like we've talked about when people go through shocking things, sometimes they have nothing. But this is 20 years later you're saying this and you're still concerned. The sister-in-law goes on to say that for the first eight years after Scott was on death row, they had a family member in there every week. And Scott, that was his lifeline. And he says that he is living from one visitation to another, which is real dedication, almost real dedication. Real dedication is the sister-in-law telling us that she is now a lawyer because she went to law school and has dedicated her life to Scott. That's dedication. I want the documentarian to be like, okay, I know you think he's innocent, right? Is there no doubt, right? Like, was there any doubt? Because it's okay to doubt things. That's also a natural human reaction. 
From the beginning, they didn't think Scott did this with all of his actions, with all of his interviews, with all of the lies and the affair and all of these things. They never asked them. Not for one second. You were like, well, eh, you know, not not one. She says that after becoming a lawyer, she can see all the issues with this case. That so brings up the question to me, is this about the fact that you think he actually didn't do it, right? He's actually innocent. Or is this about the fact that you think that he didn't get a fair trial? A, due to the media. A, perhaps Mark Garagos flew too close to the sun. You know, he made too many promises and he wasn't able to deliver. And maybe Scott would have gotten a different trial had they just tried to poke holes. And he would have been out now, even though he did commit this crime. Mike Gudgel goes on to say that he was surprised that there was not a hung jury. And I have to agree. I have to agree, I, especially after 40 hours of deliberation. I feel like after 40 hours, somebody, somebody had to be convinced. And I don't like that. I don't like when the death sentence is on the table and you have somebody standing so firm for 40 hours and then they're just like, eh, yeah, you're right. You know, I just, I don't know. I've never been a juror. I don't want to be a juror. I don't want to be anywhere near any one of these cases, okay? I just, I was surprised that this, watching it back again, that this came back the way that it did. And I don't know if I would have been able to sentence him to death. I believe he's guilty, okay? I, in my gut of guts, think that he's guilty. However, and the documentary is going to do what this documentary does, right? It's going to make you feel a certain way. And their job is to have reasonable doubt. And I, I do think that there is reasonable doubt in this case. I'm not sure that they had enough factual evidence to sentence him to death. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. If you're going to put me on the stand and you're going to try to give me the death sentence, you better have all the facts. Please, dear God, have all the facts. And that's what I try to think about, right? Like, I think Scott's guilty. But also, if I'm up there and I truly didn't do it, I don't want to be sitting on death row, you know, forever. And I really didn't. That's why the death sentence is so controversial, which is why we're here today. So after Mike Gudgel says that he was surprised that there was not a hung jury, he also goes on to say that everyone involved in the case contributed some way to a sort of conspiracy of circumstances that led to the verdict. And Mike, as I agreed on the fact that there was not a hung jury, and I was surprised, I have to disagree on the fact that I think there was a conspiracy to put Scott in prison and everybody else is to blame. We have seen his actions, his lack of cooperation, his open lies, his Google searches, his purchases, his whereabouts, and so on and so forth. I there's I there's a lot of things that he did that also contributed to the conspiracy of uh, circumstances that led to the verdict. I just have to say, Scott Peterson in this whole case did himself zero favors, negative favors negative 1,000 out of 10 favors. They talk about the media reporting rumors, and this is something that we discussed in my last couple of episodes, which if you want to see those, I'll link those in the description down below. And I don't disagree with that narrative either. Everyone wants to be the first one to get the juiciest story, right? And a lot of times when they do that, they get the facts wrong or they have rumors. And when you have something of this magnitude and you have this soap opera and sex and a mistress and murder and all these things that these people are eating up, blah, 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 you know, and then you have tabloids and you have billboards and you have T-shirts and you have all these things. How does someone like Scott Peterson get a fair trial? How do you pick 12 jurors out from under rocks who don't know who he is? to give him the fairest of trials. And after going through 50,000 pages of case evidence, Mike Gudgel says that he is narrowing it down to the burglary across the street at the Medina household. They show a police press conference saying that they have two men in custody and do not believe that any of this is related to the disappearance of Lacey, which is why it was not put into evidence into the case because the judge also agreed that it was not relevant to this case. Mike Gudgel then says that he has a working theory that there are way more people involved, but he can't prove it. 
So the discrepancies in the story are the burglars told the police that it happened on the 27th of December, which is impossible because the Medinas were already home at this time. So then allegedly they changed their story to the 26th of December. So this opens up, when did the burglary actually happen? The Peterson camp will tell you that it happened around 10 in the morning on Christmas Eve, which is when Lacey disappeared. The burglars will tell you it was the 26th and then the 27th or vice versa. And the police will tell you that it was 26th. The sister-in-law brings up a really good point, which how could they get in and out of that house on the 26th if there is media and dogs and police and everything else? on the block because Lacey has already been reported missing. So many questions. We know that the Medinas were gone from the 24th to the 26th. Do we trust the word of burglars? I don't know anymore. I'm so tired. They bring up Diane Jackson's eyewitness testimony of three dark-skinned men and a van. And they're like, well, that proves that the police got it wrong. But again, we have no factual, concrete evidence. We have Diane Jackson driving home, doesn't think anything about it until Lacey goes missing, says there's three dark-skinned men, not African-American, brown van. The police catch two white guys who admit to it who have a car. Stephen Todd admits to the burglary immediately. He's like, I may be a burglar, but I am not a killer. So the Peterson camp says that he has to be the fall guy. This is bigger than him. Now we're getting into conspiracy theories that there's some like giant like crime organization and somebody's got to take the fall for this, right? Or is he just a burglar that doesn't want to be associated with killing a pregnant woman and a mother because people like that don't do well in prison. It was Stephen Todd and Donald Pierce that were arrested and Donald Pierce is no longer with us, so we can't ask him anymore. Shireen the documentarian asks Scott, if you didn't kill Lacey, then who did? And he said, there were a lot of people in the burglary and I believe, and this is where he loses me. I believe, and I quote, Lacey, eight months pregnant, just remember that, couldn't walk, couldn't breathe, walked over there to see what was going on. A woman, eight months pregnant, who was having a hard time walking to where walking made her physically ill. And if you've ever been eight months pregnant, you know, you do not feel great. Unless she's some Brazilian jiu-jitsu master that we don't know about. I do not believe for one second that she saw something going on across the street that didn't look great and she went to confront it. Now, had he said the burglar saw her, she saw the burglars, they didn't want her to call the police, so they kidnapped her. That, that, that might be a little plausible story in my brain. But the fact that you're gonna try to convince me that she walked over there with her dog, by the way, and these men manhandled her and the dog was just like, nothing? At eight months pregnant, you don't just decide to get involved with criminals. I have a very close group of neighborhood friends. And if I saw somebody burglaring, burgling, robbing a house at 10 a.m. or some, you know, strange culprits around, I'm calling my neighbors. And if she knows them well enough to go over there, I'm sure she has their phone number and they all have cell phones at the time. So I would have been like, hey, there's a there's a van outside with a couple of people. Like, are they supposed to be there? I know you're out of town. What are you doing? Me and my neighbors, there's 12 of us. We're like family. And if we see something that's not right, we're like, hey, quick text. Hi, this is not right. I have neighbors where we walk in and out of their houses without knocking. If they're out of town and somebody is in their house, I'm not going over there. Not eight months pregnant. Not not pregnant. I'll make some phone calls. I'll call my neighbors and then we can all call the police. One of the defense attorneys said that we had an innocent man to protect and he's not capable of doing this. Which is an interesting statement. I hate that statement because people are capable of doing anything. 
including surprising us in the worst ways. And if you want to talk about physically capable, absolutely. Scott, very tall, very strong, very athletic. Lacey, short, eight months pregnant. Do I need to say more? You don't think that Scott could have carried this out with ease? I think he could have done it if Lacey wasn't pregnant. So they talk about how they have all this evidence. They talk about how they have all these leads. And then they talk about how it just kind of goes nowhere. And that makes me have to think that if you have all of this evidence, right, and you have all of these leads and you have nothing coming up, could it be that it is Scott? Now, I know that you want to believe something, right? As an investigative journalist, as a documentarian, as his sister-in-law, as his sister, you want to absolutely believe that Scott is innocent. But have you worked the theory that Scott did it? And is that more plausible than everything else? So we're introduced to the theory that there is a brown van and there are three to four witnesses that can attest to the van. My gudgel goes on to say that there was an orange van, but there was an orange van that had been burned the day after Lacey's disappearance in the airport district, which is not far from Lacey and Scott's house, and which is not the greatest area, according to the documentary. I don't know anything about it. And then the police examine the brown van and decide that it has absolutely no con connection to Lacey's disappearance. So that's just that. 2014, they start looking more into the van and they find that it came from a moving and rigging company where the employees could take vehicles home and bring them back. And my gudgel thinks that because it was burned and not just brought back to the parking lot, that it had to be associated with this case. The last person to sign out the sheet of the van had a criminal record and an association with Steve and Todd. But now I'm going to ask you to very closely follow me because this one's a hard one. A family member of the owner of the van, had an association with Stephen Todd. Stephen Todd's wife's sister. Stephen Todd's sister-in-law? Why didn't they just say that? Stephen Todd's sister-in-law lived in a house right next to where the burnt van was found. Then we talked to Modesto Arson Investigator Brian Spitalski, and he says that he noticed that in the back of the burnt van there was a mattress where there was a gas can that was placed on top. And his thought was that because they placed the gas can on the top of the mattress, that if you set the gas can on fire, it would explode and completely destroy the mattress. Ha ha! You were wrong. Nay, nay, that's not what happened. What happened was that the gas can actually protected the mattress and the area underneath. It was a metal gas can. The arson investigator also said that it looked like there was blood on the mattress. Then they test it, and it comes back positive for blood. However, this test was a field test, so what they needed to do was send it to the lab and do a more in-depth test. Brian then notifies the Modesto Police Department because he thinks that the van could have something to do with Lacey's disappearance. After they sent in the initial field test to the lab, no blood was detected. My theory is, with all tests, false positives and false negatives. I have to assume that's what happened. You take it in the field, you have to go more in depth, you got a false positive. And then the van is never brought up again. They are going to try and file for DNA testing on the mattress, which I agree with. I think if you have something that close to Stephen Todd and you have Stephen Todd that close to the house when she was kidnapped, just test it. I have my theories on why they won't, but we'll get there. Brian goes on to say that it needed further investigation and I completely agree. All options should be looked at before a person is sentenced to death. Absolutely, 1,000%. However, the judge is also on board with the theory that Lacey was gone before 10, 18 a.m. And then the argument becomes, if you don't give the jury all the options of what could have possibly happened, they only hear one option, and that's Scott, which calls into question the investigation. Should the van have been investigated further and... My answer is yes. You can place Stephen Todd in the Medina house, he's admitted to it, around the time that Lacey disappeared. Stephen Todd can also be placed around the burnt van. Just test the blood on the van because it's going to come back one way or another. Either it's Lacey's 
or it's not. And then you can just throw out the van. A mailman came out and said that he dropped the mail between 10.35 and 10.55 and there was no dog at the house, which always barked at him and the gate was open. And they say that this means that Lacey had to be out walking the dog. You know, it's it's interesting with this documentary because I felt like, right, the whole point of this documentary is to pull holes in the prosecution story and about how they didn't have enough ed- evidence. But I also find that the Scott Peterson side does not have enough evidence. I don't, they say, well, if the dog didn't bark at the mailman, then uh, she had to be out walking the dog. How do you know? How do you know? Again, we don't know. He was there between 10.35 and 10.55. Didn't Karen Service put the dog in the backyard about 10.18? Which is why everybody thought that she was gone before that time. Isn't that why that's the magic number? The sister-in-law also says that if if Lacey was alive when Karen put the dog in the backyard, then she had to be home. How would we know that? How, how would we know that? We don't know that. Scott claims that when he was given discovery for the trial, he realized that the police weren't really following up on any of the tips that came in, such as, and this seems sort of credible to me because he is a former Los Angeles reserve officer, Tom Harshman, saw a woman being forced into a van and he called the police. So they call Tom for this documentary and he says that he saw a pregnant woman in a van and they were worried about her. She had used the bathroom, so they took her to a fence and then they manhandled her back into the van, but the wife didn't want Tom to get involved because if they were gonna hurt her, then they were gonna hurt Tom. But then, This sat with Tom so bad that he didn't only call the police twice, he went into the police department. And I do have to say, when you're going to charge someone with murder, and they're going to face the death penalty, that blood is also on your hands if you didn't do your job. Now you have somebody coming in who says that he saw a pregnant woman being manhandled into a van, and then we find a burnt van. And one of the people being, you know, uh, interviewed in the documentary comes up with a, a great statement even if it's not Lacey. Shouldn't you find out who that is? If there is a pregnant woman in danger, shouldn't we also be concerned? Which kind of lets me know how much pressure the police department is under at this time. I mean, imagine the scrutiny because America is just all eyes on the Modesto Police Department, right? They have to focus on this case. So what if because they're focusing on this case so much that there's another case unraveling right in front of them? Or what if it was Lacey? And I know that you can't look into every single tip that comes in, right? You get psychics, you get dog psychics, you get people who just want to be involved in stuff like this. And I can only imagine the amount of tips that came into this police department. But that one, from a former reserve officer, I just, I might have taken that one a little bit more seriously. But also, at the time, did they have the resources to do that? I don't know. Xavier Aponte, a former correctional officer, January of 2003, comes on and says that there was a police officer that was in charge of monitoring prisoner phone calls. And there was a rumor on the street that Lacey had interrupted a burglary with Todd and Pierce. He then calls Modesto Police Department twice. And again, this is another tip that they didn't follow up on, allegedly according to him. The Peterson camp goes on to also say that this was evidence that was not turned over to Peterson's attorneys. And the police have claimed that they've looked everywhere for this tape and it does not exist. You have to say let's play devil's advocate and let's look at both sides. And and I don't know if it goes to the fact that Scott Peterson is innocent, but I think in this case, it's whether the police department did this on purpose or just didn't do their jobs to the full extent. And I have to say, if there is evidence now, right, that comes out that proves that Scott is innocent, a man in the lawsuits, Holy shit. <laughs> um, imagine, I mean, you have lawsuits, you have people that would need to resign, 
you have people whose reputations would be completely tarnished by this, which rightfully so if you didn't do your job to the full extent just because you wanted to nail Scott Peterson to the wall. And listen, I think that Scott Peterson is as guilty as the rest of them. That's not my argument. My argument is I'm not sure he got a fair trial. I think he did it. But if I'm proven wrong, I mean, sometimes you just got to eat a little crow. And I got to tell you, as much as I think that Scott Peterson did it, if you come out and you prove that he's innocent, I may not like him. I may not like it. But that is a man who should not be in prison. If we just imprisoned people forever because they're weird, I would not be making a podcast right now. It should not be based off of characteristics of a person. It should be based off of factual evidence. What I do believe is that if Mark Garagos and Scott Peterson's defense team came up with a different game plan, maybe they couldn't have proved that he was innocent, but they could have probably proved that the prosecution didn't have what it took to sentence him to death. So two former detectives go on to say about Xavier Raponte that he came out and recanted his statement. He could not tell them which police officer had told him that. He couldn't provide them with the tape that it was on. And then when they interview Xavier Aponte again, he says that he didn't recant his statement, but he did say that this is hearsay of information that was on the street. He comes out and says that this is hearsay on the street. I'm not sure why we interviewed him in the first place. Just to say that it was a tip that wasn't followed up on, even though they did follow it up and when they pressed him further, he kind of took it back. I don't know. Now we get to the Croton watch, or as Scott liked to call it, his, her wrapper watch, Lacey's wrapper watch that she got from her grandmother. Lacey inherited this from her grandmother, and on December 31st, there was a Croton watch that was sold to a pawn shop by a woman. They are talking to the owner of the pawn shop. He says the Modesto Police Department came there, asked for the watch, picked it up, and left. Scott says that he didn't know anything about the watch until after he was arrested. What he does say, which is accurate, is that the police have to turn over any evidence, especially any evidence that would prove Scott's innocence. The detectives say that it never amounted to anything except speculation because they could never actually prove that it was Lacey's watch. I have to say at this point of the documentary, I do not disagree with the Peterson camp, which if you would have asked me two episodes ago, that would not have been the case. But I have to say that by our law and by our standards and by our judicial practice, right, if you have interviews or you have reports or you have evidence or you have anything that has to be turned over to the defense team, it has to. In 2020, Scott was taken off death row. And the reason that this was overturned was because the judge asked the jury if they were against the death penalty. And if you said that you were against the death penalty, he said that you were just excused, which what he was supposed to do is ask you why you felt that way. You were supposed to get interviewed. And what the judge did was against the law in California. And for that, for that reason, the Supreme Court in California overturned Scott's sentence to life in prison without parole. That's a big deal. Again, if you're going to get sentenced to death, like, can we at least follow the law? However, in a turn of events, getting off of death row is not great for Scott. Now he doesn't have state-sponsored representation or access to it, and he loses a lot of resources because he's not on death row anymore. And one of the interviewees makes a really great point and says, 20 years later, and now he's off of death row, and the families can't afford great lawyers. And people stay in prison because it becomes a financial burden that nobody can pay for. And you just don't have the money to be free. And they're kind of stuck in this place, and that's why they needed to reach out to the LA Innocence Project, because they needed to get the DNA testing that was not tested at the time of his trial. The Innocence Project has now asked for 17 items to be DNA tested, including evidence that has to do with the Medina burglary. The judge denies nearly all of it, nearly all of it, except for the duct tape that was found on Lacey when she washed up at Point Isabel. I just, I honestly, I just want them to test everything for one reason 
or another. Either none of this comes back to Scott and he's completely innocent. And now you have Lacey and Connor gone and Scott has been locked up for 20 years for absolutely no reason. Or everything comes back to Scott and Lacey and Connor are gone and we could just stop all this nonsense. No more appeals, no more nothing. You're guilty, end of story, period. I am curious why they were denied. Just test them. Be done with it. The documentary states that we always hope that the courts get it right, but if they don't, it is incredibly hard to fix, which is so sad because there are a lot of people who don't have the resources or the money or the family support or anything, and they do. They sit on death row forever or prison. It also goes on to say that the media plays a significant role in Scott's verdict, and I, I don't disagree. I don't know how you get 12 jurors untouched by the media storm that was Scott and Lacey Peterson. I don't. At the end of the episode, they have a quote from Sharon Roca, which is Lacey's mom, and it says, and I quote, I'll read it to you verbatim. It has been almost 22 years since I have seen or talked to my daughter. She was murdered by her husband. And since his conviction in 2004, he has been in court numerous times trying to get his conviction overturned. I believe this is not about proving his innocence, but instead about his relentless pursuit to be freed from prison. When will this end? The reason that I watched this one first is because I really wanted to go into it as objective as possible. I already had my thoughts. I still think Scott is guilty. There's no part about this documentary that convinced me otherwise. I do have to say that. But I also have to say that I think that this documentary did its job. Do I think that Scott is innocent? No. Do I think that there was enough concrete evidence to sentence someone to death after watching this? Also, no. I came across this article that I wanted to read to you guys, and I will put it up on the screen as well. But it puts everything in a timeline. And I'll also leave where I got it from in the description box down below if you wanted to uh, read it yourself. So one of the things that caught my eye was that they have verifiable events leading up to the day and on the day of the disappearance. And then they have Scott's retelling of this account, which is why sometimes it's easier for our brains to figure things out when things are like linear, you know? So Peterson researches boats and tides on December 8th. He buys his boat December 9th. He buys a fishing license and lures on December 20th. The neighbor finds uh, the dog wandering with the leash on the street alone Christmas Eve morning at 1018. That's when all of this starts. At 1254 p.m., Scott makes it to the Berkeley Marina and launches his boat. At 215 p.m., Scott leaves a voicemail on Lady P Lacey Peterson's phone. 5.17 p.m. Now, mind you, he got home at 4.30, 4 or 4.30-ish. 5.17 p.m., Scott called Lacey's mom to see if Lacey was at her house and then told her mom that Lacey was missing, which is very interesting verbiage to me because I think if I just wasn't home... My husband would call my mom and then be like, where's my wife? I think I would get more angry phone calls. Like, hello? Anybody? Like, you know what I mean? I don't think he would go straight to I'm missing, which also I find odd. 5.17 p.m. and 9.55 p.m. Between then, Peterson calls Lori Heinz, Stacy Boyers, and Lacey's mom for a second time to tell them that Lacey was missing. Between 5.17 p.m. and 9.55 p.m. on Christmas Eve, Lacey's friends and family start searching for her. 5.47 Christmas Eve, Lacey's dad called the police to report Lacey was missing. 9.55 p.m. Christmas Eve, Detective Al Brocchini was called to go to the crime scene. I don't, yeah, I don't know. If I was missing, I think I would get a lot of angry phone calls more so than I'm missing and, and people would call the police. I think I think if I didn't show up to pick up my kids, my husband would be like, there's no way. Um, but if I just like wasn't home, I don't know. I don't know if he would feel the same way. So now I want to put up, this is Scott Peterson's defense timeline of the day of Lacey's disappearance. 5.45 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. December 23rd, the day before Lacey goes missing, Scott and Lacey went to Lacey's sister's salon for haircuts. 
They picked up pizza after and watched Monday Night Football. 8.30 p.m., Lacey speaks to her mother on the phone about Christmas Eve dinner. 7 a.m., Lacey wakes up. 7 to 8 a.m., Lacey Peterson gets dressed and ate cereal. So even not that morning, but the night before, right? She talks to her mom 8.30 p.m., December 23rd, and that's the last time anybody hears from her. So a lot could have been done that night. We focus a lot on before 10, 18 a.m., which means that morning, but it really could have been any time that night or that morning. 8 a.m., Scott wakes up, 8.40 to 8.45. Lacey shopped for a Gap scarf and a sunflower umbrella stand, allegedly, from what Scott says, because that was on their computer. 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., they watch Martha Stewart Living, 9.30 a.m., Note he has stated different times between 9.30 and 10.30 was the last time Scott Peterson saw her alive because he left at 10 to go to the Berkeley Marina. 10.30 to 10.56, checked his emails at the warehouse. 11.30, left the warehouse for the Berkeley Marina. 12.54, buys a boat launch ticket at the Berkeley Marina, which is verified. 2.15, verified leaves voicemail on Lacey's phone. 325, buys gas at a Chevron in Livermore. 415 to 445, he returned to his warehouse. 445 to 517, got home, found the front door unlocked, found Mackenzie in the yard with the leash on, called out for Lacey, washed his clothes, washed his mop bucket, ate some pizza, drank some milk, took a shower, called Lacey's mom at 517 to see if Lacey was at her house. The mom says no, and he immediately goes to she's missing. My heart breaks for everyone in this case. Just, I, there's no, you know, and I've heard a lot of people ripping the sisters, and I've heard a lot of people ripping, you know, the sister-in-law, and I, I can't imagine what it's like to be on that side either. Nobody wins. Nobody wins. But let me know your thoughts in the comment box down below. I will be watching Lacey's side of the story. Um, it's on Netflix, and I think it's also a three-part series. I am interested to hear what they have to say. And now that I have all the information from this case going up with the information from that case, I'm very excited to put it all together and see how my thoughts change. If you like what you see here today, don't forget to subscribe. It helps out the channel, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.